Todd, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, John. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be visiting um, this wonderful um, institute and, and getting to know some of your colleagues here. And um, what, I, what, I, what I wanted to do today very much is what HUD said, is to provide a bit of a foundation for what you'll hear about the rest of the day. Um, in talking about the human genomics landscape. And what I'm going to try to do in very rapid fashion over the next 30 minutes or so is to tell, tell you a little bit about the past as a means to tell you about where we are right now as a platform for where we're going in the future. And I think having that context, especially some of the technological advances, I think will very much paint the kind of picture that's going to be very relevant for what's being discussed in subsequent talks. And a lot of different places I could start historically, but probably the most appropriate one is uh, if we go back to October 1990 with the launching of the Human Genome Project, um, this large, international, audacious effort um, that was quite unusual for biomedical research to tackle at the time because of its scale, because of its um, uh, consortium-based approach, um, and because of the challenge of what was it was up against. Now, I can speak for a long time, but I won't about the Genome Project. I got involved, as HUD implied, really on day one of the Genome Project, a freshly graduated MD, PhD um, in training in pathology. And I will tell you, as a frontline participant of the Genome Project from the beginning to the end, um, it was quite a roller coaster ride. Uh, when the project began, there was an incredible sense of purpose, of mission. This was so important. We knew this would sort of change so many aspects of biomedical research. At the same time, it was absolutely terrifying because we had absolutely no idea how we were actually going to do this. Uh, but nonetheless, you bring really smart people and motivated people together. You give them an overwhelmingly compelling uh, goal, sequence the human genome, and you put them to work, and indeed it works. And uh, in just a short period of time later, long before we ever thought it was going to take, we had announcements that the draft sequence of the human genome was now in hand, and that caught a lot of attention both politically and uh, within the press. But of course, scientifically, what was even more important was publishing that work, getting all that data out there and having scientists use it. And of course, the milestone there is this publication, which was a good way to start, um, in some ways, this new century, and I think will be a sort of a landmark publication that even 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now will point back to this issue of nature and point to how it really began to change the face of biomedical research, having in hand at least a draft sequence of the human genome. But we all went back to the laboratories, finished that sequence to higher quality, and then in April of 2003, uh, completed the sequence of the human genome, uh, put that out, and declared the human genome project over. Now, with that success behind us, and remarkably, it was just nine years ago or so, and this April will mark the ninth year of having this, uh, this milestone accomplishment, a lot of attention then turned, what happens to this new field of genomics? What happens with this opportunity with having in hand the sequence of the roughly three billion letters that constitute the human genetic blueprint? And lots of different areas of genomics have grown up since. The one that's most relevant to the National Institutes of Health and the National Human Genome Research Institute that I now direct was, was actually one that both the popular press and the scientific press uh, began to immediately recognize was a compelling area almost as soon as the Genome Project ended. And such as New York Times Magazine and Science Magazine started to recognize that the intersection of genomics and medicine was going to be an incredibly fertile area for the next phase of biomedical research. And like a drumbeat, you started to hear phrases such as genomic medicine which is largely synonymous with personalized medicine or individualized medicine, or even here it recently referred to as precision medicine, I tend to use genomic medicine, and by that I mean healthcare tailored to the individual based on genomic information, not treating individual patients generically as humans, but being able to peer into their unique genetic makeup and in some way tailoring the way we diagnose and treat disease in that individual. Well, what I can tell you is that uh, two years, I've been involved in genomics, as I said, since the beginning of the Genome Project, but two years ago I became director of the institute I've now worked at for about 17 and a half years. And I will tell you that as a director, I spent a lot of time and my staff spends a lot of time really focusing on what is the most compelling things we could be doing as a funding agency to accelerate the area of genomics that is the most relevant to us, which is genomic medicine. And in thinking about this, I want to describe to you our, our logic as a framework, which is very much a journey, because all of us are involved in a journey. That journey involves uh, traversing a path that begins as a starting point, not the ending point, the starting point, the Human Genome Project, and will end when we actually realize genomic medicine broadly and generically defined. <laughs> now, I stand here quite humble telling you that I don't know all of the steps that will be involved in this very important journey. I know a lot of them, but I'm sure there's some ones that I won't know right now and we'll have to figure out as we go. 
But I go into this journey quite optimistic, knowing we were quite successful at the Human Genome Project, and we simply have to be successful at realizing genomic medicine. And only if we are successful do I think we truly will fulfill the promise of why we sequence the human genome in the first place as part of the Human Genome Project. So what I thought I would do now is tell you five major steps that have already been uh, begun um, uh, in this path towards geno realizing genomic medicine since the end of the Human Genome Project. And these five steps are just five that I think nicely illustrate the domains of research activity that were compelling and important since the end of the Human Genome Project, and it does begin to point us closer and closer to realizing genomic medicine. So what's one of the first steps that had to be accomplished, having sequenced the human genome? Well, it was actually understanding what that sequence meant defining the function of the human genome sequence. And the reason that's so important is because the Human Genome Project was just about producing this. It actually meant more than just this, actually three billion of those letters in order, precisely from one end of each chromosome to the other. But there was much to be learned about the language, the grammar, the syntax of the human genome sequence. And when the Genome Project ended, and even now, we barely know how to interpret this incredible treasure trove of information embedded in the sea of A's, G's, T's, and C's. It's one of the reasons you heard that we went off and sequenced other species' genomes, mouse and, and rat and dog and chimpanzee and various others, as a tool to be able to compare our genetic blueprint to other animals' genetic blueprint to get clues about what things are in common and how it is that we can actually read that sequence by simply cryptography-like methods of comparing our sequence with other species' sequence. There's projects like the ENCODE project, Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, that our institute launched that aim to catalog all of the functional parts of our genome, the genes just to start with, but what about all these RNA molecules that are getting made and are not even involved in making proteins but are involved in regulatory aspects, and knowing all the regulatory sequences that are, 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 are sprinkled throughout our genome. And of course, we've learned a lot in the last eight years that it's not all just about the G's, A's, T's, and C's. We know that our DNA is decorated with, with, with different chemicals, methyl groups, and associated with histone proteins. And there's a whole epigenomic landscape of decorations on our DNA, and all that encodes function and information. And we are developing better and better methods for understanding where those sequences are and making that available on the internet to everybody. And what I will tell you is eight years later, how far are we in understanding the function of the human genome? Well, maybe at best, we're sort of at a cliff note stage, to be honest with you. This is not something we're going to fully understand a decade, even two decades, three. I think that 30, 40 years from now, I think we'll still be interpreting some nuances about how DNA confers function and how the human genome actually works. But we've made a pretty impressive start over the last eight years, but we're staying very laser focused to continue that effort to understand human genome function. A second step that we've begun to pursue and are making progress in is not just to understand how a hypothetical human genome sequence functions, but knowing how all of us differ, because we're actually interested in variation among genomes because all of us has a slightly different genome. In fact, by the way, all of us, of course, have two genomes. We have the genome we got from mom and the genome we got from dad. About six billion letters is our individual genetic blueprint. And sprinkled across that genome are lots and lots and lots of variants indicated here by V. In fact, if you look to the person sitting to your left or the person sitting to your right, you and that person differ in about three to five million places in terms of individual letters. And there's probably tens of thousands of places that you have other kinds of variants, structural variants, insertions, deletions, rearrangements, copy number variations, and so forth. So there's tremendous variability in terms of numbers between you and the person sitting next to you. But the great, 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 great majority of those variants are without any biological or phenotypic consequence. They're innocent, or so we believe. But there is a subset that's very important. And that subset of variants uh, can either be a variant that might end up conferring risk for a disease, or maybe it's a more positive variant that ends up giving an attribute that's a, a biologically more positive. But what the goal was was to start to catalog these variants across human populations and have those all available in databases so that subsequently we could go in and figure out which ones are biologically relevant and which ones are not. And so you might have heard about projects like the International HapMap Project or the Thousand Genomes Project, which has a an interesting name because we're now studying over 2,000 genomes in the 1,000 Genomes Project. But these are all efforts to catalog, especially the more common variants that exist. Because by the way, compared to the person sitting next to you, you don't each have your unique set of variants. You have many variants in common. Lots of variants are in common among many of us. But increasingly, if we could catalog those, we could then study them and figure out their role in, in, in health and disease. 
And so those projects have led to immense catalogs of variants and lots of information about how those variants differ among different human populations across the globe. And we basically developed a much better understanding about human genomic variation. And the reason we really did that was to start to set up the third step along this journey. And that's to start to dissect which of those variants play a role in human disease, to understand the genomic basis of human disease. And I'm sure throughout today, you're going to be hearing increasingly about the genomic basis of human disease. Let me set the stage for this just to sort of give you a big picture view, especially for those of you who don't think about genetics every day. If you, you can sort of divide all, by the way, all diseases essentially have a genetic um, component associated with them, at least a genetic influence, some more overt than others. But you can broadly, very broadly, defi divide diseases into two categories based on their genomic architecture. The purpose of today, the topic of today, is this kind of a disease, a rare disease. Now, rare diseases are genetically simple. They're genetically simple because they involve typically one gene. They're monogenic. So in other words, the risk for getting a, disease, a, a rare genetic disease is a, a, a variant in a single gene. That's the dominant risk. Now, there might be an environmental contribution, and there might be some other variants elsewhere in the genome that influence the severity of the disease. But if you take a disease that HUD mentioned earlier, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, sickle cell, it has basically defects in a single gene that are the major risk for getting that disease. And these are incredibly important, as you heard about, and represent what we're going to hear about all day. But those are very different genomically than common diseases. And common diseases, diseases like hypertension and diabetes and asthma and various forms of mental illness, some forms of cancer and so forth, they're, they're common. Um, and they're certainly filling hospitals and clinics around the world, but they're also incredibly complicated. And they're ready, the reason they're complicated is that they are, they are basically due to variations in multiple places in the genome that all conspire along with what is typically a greater influence of the environment to end up conferring risk for getting that disease. And the real question and the purpose of the Genome Project was to develop an infrastructure for teasing out these different genetic variants and defining their role in rare genetic diseases and increasingly common genetic diseases. There were real questions, though, about how easy it was going to be to do the detective work to get down to these variants, and eventually would we ever be able to get enough statistical power and sophisticated studies to untangle the complexities of common diseases. Well, it's been pretty impressive, especially on this side, and it's increasingly getting more getting optimistic on this side. So let me tell you about rare genetic diseases. Well, if we just look at rare genetic diseases whose ge the genetic defect has been identified, uh, we could plot that as a cumulative histogram. Um, and let me just remind you, starting back in the early 1980s, the Human Genome Project began there. And as soon as some of the earliest maps and sequence from the Human Genome Project came out, sure enough, as we expected, this greatly accelerated the pace with which we could identify the genetic basis of rare diseases. And so, in fact, and this trend continues up through last year, I just haven't put that last bar on, we actually are doing pretty well in getting an inventory of genetic defects associated with rare diseases. So, for example, if you just sort of look at the full set of types of, of Mendelian diseases and traits, we now know the molecular basis for almost 3,500 of these. Um, the great majority of those, of course, that you could see, in fact, virtually all of them have come since the beginning of the human, since the end of the Human Genome Project, beginning of the Human Genome Project. Now, that's the glass half full. The glass half empty is there's still about 1,800 uh, rare genetic disorders or traits that we don't yet know the molecular basis for, and another 1,900 or so that we think there is a single gene involved in the trait or the disease that we don't yet know. And one might imagine this would be a great priority area for future study. Remember this pie chart. You're going to see it in a later slide. So this is the news since the end of the Genome Project with respect to rare genetic diseases. Now, I'm not going to talk about the massive um, accumulation of scientific achievement and publications that have transpired um, with respect to common genetic diseases, because it's not the topic of, of today's symposium. But shown here is just a simple graphic that depicts the fact that over the last five years or so, there have been over 1,000 publications describing what are known as genome-wide association studies, or GWAS studies, you might have heard of, where they are taking these complicated um, genetic disorders, or these complex genetic diseases, and doing some very fancy uh, genetic studies that allow you to, to statistically associate discrete regions of the human genome with variants that confer risk for that disease. And each one of these lollipops decorating all over the different human chromosomes represent one of these successful studies and one of these successful associations. 
And what I can tell you is that this has catalyzed much research that was really at a standstill in some cases with respect to being able to do the detective work to get at the, the variants that are conferring risk for complex diseases. Now, this is still really hard. In very few cases do we know the actual specific variant conferring that risk. But what I will tell you is that the acceleration that's taken place with respect to getting down to candidate regions is changing the face of how this research is being done. Now, this is, again, sort of a glass half full. And as always, there is a little bit of a glass half empty. And let me just leave you with one other little thing that has emerged over the last four or five years. Is one last fact about this distinction between rare diseases and common diseases. It turns out that as we are cataloging more and more and more about the mutations causing rare genetic diseases, we are learning, and we sort of knew this for a while, that the great majority of these mutations in single gene rare disorders are mutations that are in coding regions, the protein coding parts of our genome. Um, this is actually good news for rare genetic diseases because this is the part of the genome we know how to interpret. It's the part we really understand mechanistically. The glass half empty for complex diseases is the fact that we are now seeing evidence that the majority, and we don't yet know if it's 60% or it's 80%, but it seems that the majority of the variants that are conferring risk for common genetic diseases are not in protein coding regions. They're in parts of the genome that we are barely starting to understand now that are involved in regulating genes and regulating how chromosomes functions and so forth. And we have a lot to learn mechanistically how those work. So it turns out this is just going to be harder to interpret. Um, and at the moment, at least, this is more straightforward at interpreting. We'll get there, but it, it sort of once again illustrates why we need to continually work at understanding how the human genome works. Because right now, the part of the genome that we understand the least is the part of the genome that harbors probably the majority of the variants conferring risk for common genetic diseases. So how are we going to take it to the next stage? How are we going to accelerate our ability to get at the remaining thousands of genetic diseases that we don't yet know the gene that is defective? And how are we going to untangle this mess, especially when it's going to be incredibly complicated to interpret? Well, to do this, we really need to have the ability to sequence many, many, many genomes of many, many different patients and control groups. And here becomes a fourth step that I want to tell you about, is the ability to routinely sequence human genomes. Now, to set the context for this step, um, which actually in some ways is the one I can give you the most positive accomplishments um, to date, um, I really have to take you back to the end of the Genome Project. Because when the Genome Project ended, a number of us at, at, at my institute um, <laughs> put together, led a strategic planning effort that resulted in this publication the day the Genome Project ended that came out. And we said lots of things about what was going to happen now that we had a sequence of the human genome in hand. And among the many things we talked about, the one that's relevant for this part of my talk was in text we mentioned that what we really needed in genomics and genetics were technological leaps that seemed so far off as to be almost fictional, but which, if they could be achieved, would revolutionize biomedical research and clinical practice. And we went out on a limb, and we said in print, and I can't believe we did it, because back then we had no idea, once again, how we were going to accomplish it. As an example, the ability to sequence DNA at costs that are lowered by four to five orders of magnitude than the current cost, allowing the human genome to be sequenced for $1,000 or less. And this was an audacious thing to put into print, because the Human Genome Project has just, had just ended, and the cost of sequencing that first human genome was something like a billion dollars. And we were basically proposing that we would develop technologies over the next handful of years that would successively lock zeros off of that figure and eventually yield the ability to sequence a human genome for $1,000. And we picked $1,000 because it seemed nicely rounded, and it's not like a reasonable cost of a clinical test at the time. Well, what I can tell you is our institute put out many granting opportunities to recruit people from all different disciplines to bring their craziest ideas to how to sequence DNA. And that was met with the private sector very nicely investing in this area with multiple companies and consider about venture capital coming into it. And all of this was sort of built around a battle cry of we need the $1,000 genome. We need the $1,000 genome because it would change the face of, of, of genomics of human genetics, and eventually of clinical care, or so it was thought. And what I can tell you is that it's been incredibly successful, because it's not that there's one new method or two or three or four or even five or six or seven. 
shown here are just the currently available new instruments, each with slightly different uh, technologies underneath the hood, each with their own perfections and imperfections, and each of which will likely be leapfrogged by the next technology that comes along. It has been an incredibly impressive set of technology development efforts that have yielded what are known as next generation or next gen DNA sequencing technologies, and it has been truly remarkable to watch, and it has happened far faster than any of us could have predicted. Now, some of you might be asking, are we at a $1,000 genome yet? Where are we in route to the $1,000 genome? And I will tell you, we track this very carefully, and I will tell you that we're just about there. Okay, we're not quite at $1,000 yet. We will coast to $1,000, I predict, in the next few years. If you follow the press, um, companies are saying they'll have it by the end of this year. What we are at, and I think we'll hear this in some of the talks today, is the ability to sequence all the coding regions, the protein coding regions in the human genome, known as the exome. You'll hear phrases like whole exome sequencing. You can now do whole exome sequencing for less than $1,000. In fact, you can get companies to do it now for less than $1,000. So it is truly incredible where we have come. And you can tell I'm, enthousi I'm enthusiastic. Last week, I went to a meeting that I actually am a, I'm an, involved with as one of the organizers down in Marco Island, Florida, Advances in Genome Biology and Technology. And that's like the meeting of the year where all the groups who are doing technology development and genome sequencing come together and show their latest stuff. And I once again was blown away because, and I'm not endorsing this company, I'm just pointing out that it's a cool thing knowing that the slide I showed you about two or three slides ago. I won't even be using it in a year because there'll be all new platforms that'll be available. That's how much de development's going on. And just the coolest thing that came out of that meeting, and every meeting has cool stuff, keep your eye on nanopore technology. I'm not endorsing this company. I'm just telling you what was reported at this meeting. But it was, this is technology for basically nanopores and lipid layers that where they're pulling the DNA through and just reading the nucleotides one after the other. And they claim that by the end of this year, they will be commercializing and selling a device that plugs into the USB port of your laptop and will be able to sequence DNA, not in a laboratory, but actually in the field right off of a laptop. And I don't know if this will work or not, and I don't know what the data quality, and I don't know what the, there are a lot of things I don't know, but what I do know is this doesn't surprise me. And if, if this one doesn't work, the next one might, and it has just truly been a remarkable wave after wave after wave of technology development. So getting to the $1,000 genome, not the problem. The cost of genome sequencing, not rate limiting. Data generation, not what we should be worrying about. All right, once again, glass half full. You want to know glass half empty? Well, the fifth step is one that's catching up with us now, because the fifth step along the way is actually understanding how to analyze the data that's being generated by these new technologies. Because these technologies now have creating the largest bottleneck in genomics and some might say just cross out genomics and say the largest bottleneck in biomedical research. And it's not generating data, it's dealing with the prodigious amount of data that comes spewing out of these sequencing instruments, for example, far faster than we can assimilate it, far faster than we can handle it. So when I go around and talk to people and what I read about and hear about all the time is that the number one bottleneck we face in this field is a computational bottleneck. <coughs> And it has many angles associated with it. There's hardware issues of too much data. How do you store it? How do you process it? How do you even push it across the internet quick enough? Do we have adequate software? Every one of these technologies, by the way, is imperfect, and you need software to sort of analyze it and tweak it and refine it. And those software tools aren't all hardened yet, and they're certainly not widely available yet. And do we have enough, and especially for trainees in the audience, please see this part. We do not have enough of a workforce being trained today to deal with this data flow and to deal with the analysis. This is a very fertile area, and people who are cross-trained in computational biology, statistics, and then biology and medicine or medicine would be amazingly helpful in the next phase of genomics research. I think we'll solve the computational bottleneck. It's a lot of technical issues we'll have to deal with, but the bottleneck won't end there. We will also have an informational bottleneck. Uh, the fact of the matter is we will have these fancy methods for reading out DNA sequence, and we will have the ability to very inexpensively sequence individual patients' genomes and clinical subjects' genomes, and we'll even have the ability to go through and filter that data. I'm sure you'll hear that word today from some of the speakers, and come up with our list of three to five million differences that exist in that individual. But that doesn't mean we'll know which of those variants are biologically important, and we'll stare and we'll stare and we'll stare at it and really wonder. And I'm sure the clinicians in the audience and the clinical researchers in the audience would recognize that if you actually had 
genome sequences of some of your clinical subjects or patients. Um, when you go to round on those patients in the morning, if you were doing it now, chances are you'd feel like this. So you'd have this <laughs> massive list, and you won't necessarily know which of the variants are relevant or not. Um, we will need to solve this, and it will be a, a, a challenge, but it's certainly, yet again, another challenge the genomics field needs to face. This is the reason why when Harold Varmus wrote a commentary in New England Journal uh, uh, last year um, uh, commemorating the 10th anniversary of the genome sequence, um, he specifically said, physicians are still a long way from submitting their patients' full genomes for sequencing, not because the price is high, but because the data are difficult to interpret. And similarly, that's why my colleague and friend Elaine Martis wrote also last year talking about the $1,000 genome, but it will then require a $100,000 analysis, and obviously <laughs> we can't let that happen. So those are the five steps I wanted to tell you about since the end of the Genome Project. Now, many of you are thinking about other steps that are going to be required, developing new diagnostic modalities. Obviously, we want to turn some of this knowledge into new therapies and new preventative measures, and there's probably lots of things I haven't thought of and some of you have thought of we could put on the slide and other things that none of us have thought about. What I will tell you is where we are right now in February of 2012 is with a tremendous amount of data that's already available, incredible technologies that are available, and opportunities that are unprecedented. And if you just think of the imagery, we now are at a point where we truly can marry images of genomics and medicine in ways that I don't think we could have anticipated we'd be there today, looking back to when the Genome Project ended. It, it has happened far quicker, I think, than any of us could have anticipated. And so because of that pace of, of, of development and opportunities, um, our institute in particular feeling the responsibility for leading genomics research, uh, and at least for, on behalf of the NIH, uh, periodically will go through and sort of develop a new strategic vision about how to move forward in this area. And we just completed that um, leading up uh, to um, a publication we put out just about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And this was a new strategic plan that would extend beyond the one we published in 2003. And if you haven't read this and you want it, please feel free to go to this website. You can absolutely download the PDF for free, and please, I would encourage you, if you haven't read this, to read it. It is very open and expansive with respect to a vision for the future of biomedical research as it pertains to genomics and route to genomic medicine. And so just in the last few minutes, I just want to tell you just sort of some highlights about where, what this strategic vision looks like and some of the programs we're putting into place that are very relevant to what you're going to be talking about today. And one of the things we heard about, which is very relevant, is that in the process of leading up to the publication of our strategic plan, we heard from many smart people in the field who said, in thinking about this journey and going from base pairs of the Genome Project to bedside, or if you prefer the metaphor, from helix to health, we have to be more sophisticated and specific in describing how we're going to make that progression. And we couldn't just say, oh, we're going to learn about the genome and then we're going to apply it clinically, that there were more nuanced steps greater specificity. And so we finally, after talking to lots of people, realized that this could be organized around five major domains of research activity. The first domain we were very familiar with, doing research to understand how genomes are put together, the structure of genomes. And even the second domain, which is, leads from the first, of course, is doing research to understand how genomes work, the biology of genomes. What we had just started to tip our toe into in some of this work around disease was using genomic research to understand the biology of disease, getting at the genomic basis of disease, and looking more towards the future, of course, recognizing we needed to then use the understanding about the biology of disease to do further research to advance the science of medicine. But we were also advised don't stop there, because just because you have a medical science advance doesn't mean you change the care of patients. You also need to be prepared to do research that demonstrates that you are improving the effectiveness of healthcare. And so once we thought about these five domains, it became very useful for thinking about um, what we had accomplished over the last 20 years and how we might need to rethink through the strategic initiatives we want to pursue over the next 20 years. What do I mean by that? Well, the way we chose to represent it was just to think about accomplishments that had been um, achieved um, in different time periods with respect to these five domains. So we go to the human genome project. Oh, by the way, we represented these as density plots where each blue dot represents a hypothetical genomic achievement, and as they pile up on each other, they change colors. So what was the genome project about? It was about exploring the structure of genomes. Um, yeah, a little bit was learned about how genomes work, but fundamentally all the action was in this first domain. Since the end of the Genome Project, we continued to learn about how genomes were put together, but a huge emphasis, as I mentioned earlier, was developing those cliff notes about how the human genome works, how genomes work in general. 
And there have been some early triumphs in understanding the biology of disease, especially for rare genetic diseases, increasingly common genetic diseases. And oh, OK, maybe a few home runs out here in these clinical domains, but they're few and far between compared to the center of gravity around these first two domains. Well, what about the next decade? That's what all of us are going to be heavily working in over the, in, in the coming years. And we believe it's going to look something like this. We will continue to explore genomes, but the next decade will yield an accelerated pace of understanding how genomes work. But most important to today's symposium is understanding the biology of disease. The next decade should bring remarkable advances. With those advances will come yet more medical advances and maybe even a few cases where it really does change healthcare. But being realistic, don't expect the center of gravity to shift to the far right very hard to actually improve the effectiveness of healthcare. It will come. We need to be patient. It's not going to all happen in the first 5, 10, or 15, or 20 years after the Genome Project, but there's every reason to be optimistic it will eventually shift over. But we believe the next decade is going to mostly be about the greatest emphasis on the second and third domain. Now, the fact of the matter is this is audacious in the scope of what we describe in the strategic plan. And don't think for a minute that it is just about one institute or one funding agency or one country even. The fact of the matter is when you read this strategic plan, do recognize it as a worldview for genomics far greater than what our institute is doing. We are just simply representing this and putting it together as a summary on behalf of the entire international biomedical research community. At the same time, you might be asking me, you know, what's NHGRI's, what's NIH's priorities are going to be? What are you specifically going to do? And if, if you are interested in that, uh, we sort of telegraph it a little in one of our text boxes in something we describe as imperatives for genomic medicine. These are what I would describe as no-brainers, things we absolutely believe we have to do and we're putting our own money into doing them. And so that's what the future is going to bring. And just in the last three or four minutes, I just want to tell you about what some of the future is going to be, things that we know we're directly involved in. That future is going to involve sequencing a lot of genomes, it's going to sequence not, not thousands of genomes, actually not even tens of thousands of genomes. I'm talking about sequencing hundreds of thousands of genomes because the cost is going to make it that you can design very well-powered studies to do what you need to be doing. Once you could be sequencing hundreds of thousands of genomes, the good news is you're going to be doing this as part of clinical research, uh, maybe eventually starting to dabble in part of clinical care. And that's all very exciting. If you want to read a little bit more about some of the clinic, earliest clinical applications, uh, a colleague of mine at NHRI and I wrote, were invited to write a commentary for Cell uh, last year, and you might want to take a look at this paper to read specifically what we were talking about. But what about the kinds of initiatives that we are launching? Um, in particular, the future of heavy amounts of genome sequencing driven by these fancy technologies whose icons are shown here. Well, what's the purpose of this symposium, the focus of this symposium? Rare genetic diseases. We believe that now is the time to push the accelerator, use these new genome sequencing technologies to fill in the rest of this pie chart, to develop a, an approach to be able to systematically plow through the remaining thousands of genetic disorders for which the gene has not been identified. And we are, um, we are putting our money where our mouth is on this. And our institute has just launched and has begun and now funding um, a new program called Mendelian Disorders Genome Centers. Uh, the goal of this is to discover genetic basis of as many Mendelian single gene disorders as possible. It will involve a program of getting samples, sequencing them, analyzing this in a consortium fashion, establishing and disseminating study designs and methods to elucidate this and to really accelerate the pace at which discovery is made. And importantly, to organize this, actually on behalf of the entire um, world, if necessary, to create and maintain a public list of human samples as a point of coordination for broad-based discovery efforts. If you want to read more about this, um, what I will tell you is we now have our consortium in place called the Centers for Mendelian Genomics, this very simple um, URL to remember. It involves a coordinating center at University of Washington, a group at Yale, and a third group, a joint group between Johns Hopkins and Baylor College of Medicine. And they are situated to take in samples. Um, appropriately uh, consented, appropriately designed samples, and, uh, and facilitate the identification of the ge genetic defect responsible for the particular disorder being studied. This program that we are now uh, funding will be part of a larger international effort that is forming, an International Rare Diseases Research Consortium, and they've already met at least on one occasion and are beginning to interact. And I think with time, you'll be hearing more and more about this consortium, again, trying to use the kind of consortium-based approaches to study of hard problems that genomics field is so familiar with, and, but apply the attention specifically to rare disease research. In addition to rare genetic diseases, I hinted at this, but I'm not going to expand on this. 
we're going to see an acceleration of really focusing on these areas of the genome that have been associated with complex genetic diseases and hopefully get at the specific variants that are conferring risk for those disorders. And in terms of the disease world, probably the lowest hanging fruit that you're going to see clinical applications on are going to be in cancer genomics. Cancer is a disease of the genome. And through efforts such as the Cancer Genome Atlas, which we do jointly with the Cancer Institute, as well as dozens of similar efforts in other countries, significant amount is being learned about the common aberrations that take place in all different forms of cancer. And with that, we believe it's going to, you're going to see um, significant uh, new developments, both diagnostically and therapeutically. Now, all this will be overwhelming, and lots of data will be generated, and those images I showed you earlier are going to tax the system. I hear over and over again, we need to develop clinical genomic information systems that are going to be integrated with electronic health records and developing simple tools for practicing physicians to be able to take advantage of the data that's going to be generated over the next 10, 20 years. And we, are, um, and we are once again involved in thinking about how we're going to fund such efforts to develop the kinds of software tools, the kind of databases, the kind of systems that are going to be absolutely essential if we're going to take advantage of the, of the discoveries that will take place as part of these efforts. So let me just close by telling you what I've spent my time describing is this path from the Genome Project to the realization of genomic medicine. At the end of my talk, I described a much more uh, uh, nuanced view of what it's going to look like um, across these specific domains. And the focus of, of the attention for this symposium, of course, is very much understanding the biology of disease. I don't want to leave you with this idea that any of this is simple. All this is incredibly difficult, and we are going to have big challenges, especially as we get more and more and more closer um, to actual clinical care and the intersection of these new technologies with the huge complexities associated with healthcare delivery. Um, but what I will say is that uh, the genomics community sort of has a view of, of great optimism, and um, I just want to leave you with a quote that I found recently of Winston Churchill, which sort of tells me exactly what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about this area. A pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, but an optimist, which are most genomicists, see the opportunity in every difficulty. So I will stop there, and I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you. And they thought the space program was exciting. Yeah, <laughs> good point. So, questions, please, for Eric. Sure. So let me take the role of the pessimist. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what about the ethical issues of this? Um, if I have a list of all my genomic variants and all the mutations I have in my genome, I really want to know this. Do I, do I really want to know that I have a susceptibility gene for Alzheimer's disease or bladder cancer? in all kinds of genes that might cause Mendelian disorders in my, my children. I mean, that will induce many other problems. Uh, mm -hmm. um, or living, like living in fear for getting a disorder, which no one can predict whether I will ever get it or not. It might affect insurance fees for the health insurance and all things like that. So it's a great question. It's, it's uh, a question that has been asked w even at the onset mm -hmm. of the Genome Project. It's the reason why the Genome Project immediately, at least NHGRI, immediately set up an ethical, legal, and social implications research program called the ELSI program at our institute. Congress has earmarks 5 percent of our budget, research budget, is dedicated to that. In a longer version of this talk, I would talk about many of these issues. What I will tell you is um, I think the genomics community has been extremely good at developing not just the list of questions, but developing a research agenda to be able to try to inform decisions about how we are going to deal with these questions. They're all excellent, and in every, at every juncture, and I, I can tell you associated with every one of our sequencing programs now has, has, has a, a projects related to these very issues you're discussing, and they're absolutely important. And, um, and uh, but mostly what I would say is we want to make sure that we have a research base before we, you know, that's pursuing uh, knowledge that will help inform answering those questions. And, they're, and, they're, and, and, and the short answer is I think people should have a choice what they, what they learn about their genomes, whether it's nothing or whether it's everything or if it's just the part that they can do something about. Um, so I, I think, and, and with that needs to come all sorts of protections, both legal and policy protections, to make sure that we gain all the benefits without incurring some of the harms that you allude to. Anyone, you, why don't you pick them? Jeff. Eric, um, I'm curious about what NHGRI is doing in terms of integrating this information with um, studies of less genetically encoded 
like the answer. So uh, we specifically are not pursuing that directly. What I will tell you is there is tremendous interest at NIH um, to address the computational bottleneck, because like I said, it's not just genomics. And uh, there are various things that are growing up around this and trying to think about strategically how this might be put into place. And you allude to something that's absolutely right. It's not just about storing the data or accessing the data. We need to be integrating this data across a whole host of research domains whether it's phenotypic data on humans or phenotypic data on worms or fruit flies or so forth, as well as all these other, not just DNA sequence, but data on, on lipids and, and glycans and so forth. It, I think data integration in some ways might be you know, a, a research area that becomes a grand challenge over the next five years, and we hear about this consistently. I think it's a great point. Mark? I think that the promise of the individualized medicine has captured everybody's imagination. One of the problems is one of your sister agencies is uh, several decades behind, and that's the FDA. Oh, I was about to ask which one, but okay, the FDA, okay. <laughs> okay. He likes to use, uh, you know, Sir Francis Gotten's statistical methods to approach approval of drugs. Yep. This is not going to work for individuals. Addressing and working on with the FDA. So, what, so the, the answer to your question is um, the importance of what the very topic you raise is so great that it's not something the Genome Institute is going to be leading on. And the leadership at NIH has recognized how important this is, and it actually is now a, one of several components in this new um, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. And uh, there, is, there is a lot going on around um, improving the very issues uh, that you raise uh, with, with FDA and have a much more harmonious sort of anticipatory um, activity be, that integrates better the research activities now and the regulatory steps that follow. Um, but absolutely, it's, it's extremely important. I'm not dodging it. I'm just telling you it's not our institute because it's even more important than our institute, higher level. The, the, uh, I have one question. The, the big elephant in the room that everybody is aware of, and you are too, uh, is, uh, is, is great ideas. Where's the money going to come from? Right. Oh, you wanted an answer. I, yeah, thought, I, I, thought, I thought you were just, I thought it was so insightful. I just, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, and because the problem is, is um, we thought that the, the genome is complicated and, and biology is mucky, and then you deal with the healthcare system, and it's, it's far worse, right? So, so the economics are, I, I'm not sure I can give you a straightforward answer. There's lots of anecdotal evidence that if we can get people the right medications, we would, you know, save money. There's lots of reasons to believe that if we would think of better preventative measures, we would save money. All these things sound great. It's the reason, I mean, the one thing I would say, it's the reason why we have the fifth domain. The fifth domain was demonstrating the improving the effectiveness of healthcare, is we need a research agenda that along the way also demonstrates that you're improving, and some of that's going to be economic improvements, um, how we're, that these things are beneficial economically. If, if they're not, we're going to run into big problems. Yeah. Last, uh, last question, Sarah. I'm probably one of the only people in this room who thinks that and as the the, the, uh, By the way, it's probably not true. Probably lots of people in this room because yeah. we all have been well, newborn screened. But yeah, the, yeah. The genes were discovered from yeah. multiple hereditary and cell genes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I, so that was in the research laboratory. Okay. So our foundation took it out of the research laboratory, and then it actually takes time to get to get certified mm -hmm. genetic tests. Yep. So I have been genetically tested for that. With, and I know my mutation. Mm -hmm. Well, my son has the same. Mutation, okay, technically, and it's in an in intron, which is unusual. So it's all those, the, I see your, your pie chart. Yeah. Okay. But as this technology comes out and then it goes back into the laboratory, there is the NIH. And what effort is the NIH in general connecting everything together? Because you can find the information, but then when you go to the researchers, and they need to put in the NIH grants. It's in a different section of the NIH. And for rare diseases, it's not necessarily being funded correctly. So, uh, so, so you take the technology here, yeah. and it needs to go to the next level. And, so and, and, and I think what you're saying is you want it here. NIH. You want this in the healthcare professional. Who's I doing. want to get it from, from yeah. here yeah. to the middle so at the end I can get it to the bedside. Exactly. Patient. 
So I think it's a great point, and it's one of the things why we have to invest, and we plan to invest in development of clinical genomic information systems, is it has to all be brought together. In particular, okay, right. as this information is coming out and going into the basic research laboratories, they have got to go back into different sections of NIH to get its funding, and the communication I don't think is really out there within the NIH in, in part because there's not an infrastructure. No, no, I actually agree with you. And we, and we hear this from patients, we hear it from advocacy groups, we hear it from physicians. And so part of it is to develop the infrastructure to allow it to, to flow in and then have it be annotated in a fashion so that then the practicing healthcare provider can access it and know what it means. So I, I actually share your view. Okay. Uh, uh, a real quickie? Yes. All right. A quick comment, because I think it's really important. Um, you know, finding these mutations yeah, doesn't tell you what it really means. I think, uh, you know, to put it in a clinical information system is important, but first of all, you have to know what it means. And for that reason, you have to take these mutations and go to a research laboratory to find out what it does on a molecular and cell biology level. Oh. And then that is going to take a lot of time, much more time than this is going to take. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real... Uh, a real good question. No, I think, the whole but I bet we'll hear from speakers today that are describing how that's being done, at least in the specific examples of what they're going to talk about. Right. 